are going to we are being joined by Mr. Uh, Rashid Yusuf, who is a public health and international uh, development consultant. However, uh, you would agree with me that some see health as a fundamental uh, right, while others see it as a commodity. The Universal Healthcare UHC has progressed from an ambition to a reality in most industrialized countries in just over a century, but not all. However, for many people, uh, particularly in poor countries, it remains a pipe dream. Now, let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Rashid. First of all, you're welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This is a national, not just a national, a worldwide um, menace that has bedeviled a lot of countries. Talking about, you know, quality healthcare. What is your reaction to this uh, uh, particular issue? Well, um, universal health coverage, uh, one of the biggest um, challenges for, is a global challenge, right? Where everyone has not been able to address it. And if you look at the and the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a goal that the treaty that all the countries in the world have decided to sign on. And um, we have until 2030 to achieve um, SDG 3.7 and 8, which is the universal health coverage. And unfortunately, um, over the years, uh, where we see decline in, um, in health uh, among, the, among the global, the, the, within all the countries. But coming back to Nigeria, since we are here, yes. let, me bring it back, let me bring it back home. Uh, Nigeria suffered one of the biggest prevalence of malaria mortality, um, tuberculosis, uh, a look at uh, maternal mortality, look at child death, a look at several, several causes of and um, several incidents of death. And you notice that Nigeria tops majority of this thing, and even HIV, where we have over 2 million. So, and when you look at this, you, you find it difficult to, to identify that there's progress in universal health coverage. Yes. And, uh, and the global agreements where we heard the United Nations agreed is that every country must invest in their health to achieve this by 2030. And the SDG, which has started since over eight years ago, and we have about um, six years now. So we have uh, 15 years, nine years ago, we have six years to go. And when you look at the target we're supposed to reach, we are nowhere close. And the biggest challenge, like I say, is every country is supposed to contribute to making this um, uh, sustainable and we are supposed to invest in it. And the African Union actually had an agreement again that all countries must contribute 15% of their budget to health. And not, le not up to four of them are even doing that at the moment. And you can see the difference between Rwanda that has been able to invest this amount of money in the health coverage that have been able to achieve. And in Nigeria, we're still struggling to actually get this budget right. And it's been over couple of years and we, we are not getting it right. Well, globally, about 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty uh, due to health challenges, 11 million of which is in Africa. And narrowing it down to Nigeria, about 77.2% uh, of Nigerians, you know, struggle and live day to day with out of pocket um, spending. How much attention are we given to, are we given to people at the grassroots who just feed from hand to mouth, menial uh, labor workers, people who just go to the market, get their daily bread for that day, and if they don't go out the next day, there's nothing for them to feed on. Yet, even more still, talking about healthcare. Well, um, we have to... Three in line with health insurance, in, just yes, yes, to yes, exactly. I get. We have three tiers of government, and then we have the federal, the states, and then the local governments. Uh, we are looking at this one of the solutions to achieve this is to provide the national health insurance and make it available to all and in the policy direction of nigeria to achieve universal health coverage to say that we should find a way to make sure that everyone gets insurance but unfortunately while the majority of those that even have access to this insurance are public and civil servants because it is mandated because it is going to you must as as, as long as yes industry, so you will get it and with that, how many of them, how many of the Nigerian population are in that demographic? So you are leaving about 70 to 80 percent of the people that need this thing out and you are giving it to the limited number of people. Statutory. 
We also agree that there should be a statutory measurement or statutory, whether it is by paying for the insurance or by tax deduction and making sure that everyone gets access to this. But it is nowhere done. Now, if um, uh, we can't get it to the people you have mentioned, the market women, the those that are, that are daily laborers and just looking for their daily needs and all of yes. that, and if we cannot provide a system where these people can actually tap into this thing, then there's a problem. But before they even get there, yes. those that are there at the moment, those that can have access to this, in, to this insurance, how many of them get quality, in, quality care? Attendance is poor. Um, when you get to the hospital and the, the clinic and then they start looking for your having to call insurance to confirm if your insurance is valid. I mean, you should have a centralized system. That's why it is called National Health Insurance Scheme, Sixth right? Yeah. And all the states that even have them are supposed to be plugged in into that. I understand that all of all these things are on paper, but implementation has been unfortunately terribly bad. And, uh, you know, but one, one good thing I will also add to it is that uh, the challenge of the, the power and autonomy, autonomy of local government. And those you have mentioned, they are getting this universal recovery actually starts from the grassroots. That is the most important thing. And that is in the poor view of the local government and the primary health care centers. So the primary health care center where everybody needs to go for their first approach or their primary contact of care, which is the primary health centers, there's a huge gap in assessing these things. Now let's Definitely. talk about some of these gaps, especially from the primary health care development agency yeah. angle. Now some months back, a popular Nigerian highlighted the challenges with basic vaccines given to children at birth, which are no longer readily available in government hospitals, only in private hospitals. And whilst this has sparked some debates, many are looking at this shortfall of gap as being one with grave consequences, that if children are not even given such a vaccine at birth, how can we say that there is a goal towards achieving universal health coverage at the third year of government in Nigeria? Absolutely. And uh, a big challenge, pricing difficult, and people have been finding their ways to manage because out of pocket is no way, it is not a structure for people to achieve or get quality health care. It is a standard rule. This, this thing has been there. People that are developing this policy, some of them are academicians, they are clinicians, they know that this is a reality. So why then have you not found a way to make sure that this works? And like we always say, the funding is a problem. Now, if you get to the hospital uh, as a mother and they're taking your child or you're a pregnant woman, and then on your day of delivery, there are some vaccines that you're not supposed to get and are along the line for the next one year. And in that same hospital, there is supposed to be a safe delivery unit, right? And you cannot even get the primary access to these vaccines at that particular time. So in the next six, years, six months, one event they're supposed to say, how will they get it? They won't. And then that is why we now continue to have all these challenges of polio returning back to Nigeria. Yes. I mean, after eradication. And that's why we could not even achieve the MDG goals for, for Millennium Development Goals of, for Health. Well, well if, if you say that, um, you know, the NHIS is, isn't really uh, effectively attending to the needs of uh, subscribers or people who need uh, some of these services, is that why we sort of see a certain drift away from NHIS to uh, private HMOs where people would rather uh, have their, their their families registered with these private HMOs as uh, as opposed to being with the NHIS. Is that is that the effect of what is happening? Absolutely. I mean, you 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 want to you want to be part of the system, get quality health care, and Nigeria has promised you that it's going to provide you with a national health insurance structure for you to tap into. But you go there, you can get it. But now, even the minority of those that it is the mi minority of those that are actually going for the private HMOs. Yes. Because uh, there's also one structural challenge with it. Even with the elites or those that are in the middle uh, middle income range, some of them can even access these private HMOs. And it's one of the challenges, the amount. It's quite expensive. It's quite expensive. Then follow, following up to that is that you want to register for that. They take about two months, three months before they verify if you should be on that plan. Eligible eligible. On I, I mean, so plan. what exactly are we doing in that regards? And everybody has been quiet about it. So what structure? There is structure that you mentioned that we have, all this, but how do you implement this thing? Well, who, who, who is to blame now? Are, are we going to hit at the uh, Ministry of Health? Is it the uh, public hospitals? 
or the workers themselves, the, the public uh, health care workers themselves? Who is at fault with regards to quality delivery uh, of, of these services? Well, um, uh, while I would blame the government and all the line agencies and um, workers and staffs and all of that, I still do understand that uh, funds are not really available. So, uh, and I know that they are pushing and trying their best for that, but it is still not enough. Yes. Because if you have a target to achieve something in the next six years and you've not gotten halfway through, then we, we are not getting there. And the people, the majority of people that are suffering, I mean, look at the population of Nigeria, almost 60 to 70 percent are young people. And then we are talking about university health coverage. Ah, these young people even assessing this. And when you look at the challenges that young people, they, when you talk about the health challenges in Nigeria, majority of it affects young people, which are the larger population of the country. So, uh, Ministry of Health, National Primary Health Care Development Agencies, I know they are supposed to provide policy and structure, and they are doing that, to be fair. But they need to make sure that they are very, very accountable to this. I know that they are trying, but accountability is important. And but transparency, going, and transparency as well. Transparency. And going back to those that promised to fund, like yeah. the basic um, healthcare fund, where people have pledged several amount of money until today, uh, we are not sure exactly where those funds are going into. But which brings me back to, I believe the solution, primary solution is primary healthcare with the local government. Now, everyone has to go back to the drawing table. If the local government has an autonomy now and they have their funds available to them, where they're supposed to provide the primary health care services. Because federal governments will claim that they have the structure, which is true, because the federal hospitals, when everybody is sick, everybody is going to federal hospitals for care. Yes. And they, they will attend to you, although we, you are not supposed to be there. And others will go to the secondary tertiary hospitals, which are the general hospitals in states. In state. At some point, they can also, they, they, they do a lot there. They try, and they also sometimes overwhelm. People have malaria. You're having malaria. You don't, there's nothing for you to go and need secondary health. And uh, that's um, a general hospital. You don't need or to be there. FMCs. Or FMCs. Yeah, you don't need all those things. Those are, you, you, when you're talking about specialist hospitals, or when you're having some situations that are beyond primary uh, health challenges. So the structure of the primary health care needs to be funded and first is why they are getting the money from the federal government that is trickling down to them there is now a chance for the local government to prioritize so i'll bring it like uh, as he asked i will now say the challenge and what we have to question now is the local government chairman we have to take it down to the root because when you're talking about the majority that is where it's really lazy so we have to identify the local government chairman and make sure that they are accountable to the money that they've started receiving and making sure that our people in their community get the right health care in the primary health care center. So addressing the, the matter from the root cause From the first. root cause, yes. Well, if you're just joining us, you're watching our broader topic of conversation on a Friday edition of our flagship program, Morning Express, as we look to address the gaps that are hindering the implementation of universal basic health coverage in Nigeria. Now, owing to the SDG report of 2024, 17% of the goals are on track. The world is lapsing behind in achieving this. Now, quite highlighted by a guest in the studio, 3.7 dwells on universal health coverage. Now, he has highlighted the need for improved budgetary allocations. Now, funding is still one of the basic banes of achieving this. But now looking at our approach to health and well-being, it is also coming at a time when the cost of acquiring medication is skyrocketing. Last year, a lot of Nigerians were thrown aback. When GSK exited the shores of Nigeria, you discuss with some people, they tell you they resort more to traditional medicine. Now, this is one of the other challenges in what we look at basic healthcare. You made mention of malaria and accessing malaria care. We will commend the government in that study. Go to some primary healthcare centers, testing is done for free. Malaria interventions are getting implementing partners to put their hands on the table and ensure this is coming all the way. But how do we look at this issue of over the counter? high cost in medication. People live with uh, ailments that they need daily medication. Is there a way we can incorporate this into our quest for universal health coverage? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that, that, the universal health coverage usually one of the key areas is pharmaceuticals. Yes. So because you are sick, you can get a test done and all of that. But when it now comes to acquiring care, they need drugs and they need uh, you need medication and you cannot and that afford is where the, the expense comes yeah, in. Yeah, the, the expense comes in. You go to some hospitals at the at the gate, you find people showing you their prescription. Please, I need to get this drug. They've done the test at least to an extent. Maybe they found way to but then getting to the drugs is a big problem. 
And um, I, I applaud the president and uh, Professor Pate, the Minister of Health, uh, in identifying that there is need for structure, production of drugs in Ninja. That is the, that's, the, that's the way we can't, and that's why the, the World Health Organization and the Global Assembly have said that it is important that you take charge of the care of your people. We are getting support from outside there and all of that. Sometimes it should just be promises. And sometimes the funds that are being getting will go into the structures where you have to employ people, manpower, transportation, and all of all this. Not necessarily into the services. In, no, not necessarily into the services. So if there's priority, if there's priority, and then you have a structure at hand, and then you make sure that hands are on are on deck. Yeah. You have people that have studied pharmac uh, pharmacognosis, pharmacology, you have medical doctors, you have microbiologists, biochemists, and all of those people available that knows how to put this thing into structure. Then we will not have to start worrying about GSK exiting because we would have had some form of infrastructure. I mean, GSK didn't only ex exit in Nigeria, right? And the Pfizer also, they are here. I mean, when you look at your country, you have a home. But you don't have the structure for it. You have borrowed the TV, you borrowed the extension, you borrowed everything. <laughs> At the time, it's getting, but then they will eat everything. Your home will be empty. So, as you're funding and you're saying you're increasing health coverage or you're providing budget for, for health care, this is part of the infrastructure where you can have professionals in this field be here in Nigeria, proceeding these things. And that is why I have a challenge with, uh, and that's why labor is also another problem. People have studied all of all these things, and then there are no infrastructures for them to work. Why are we only talking about GSK and people are saying everything is expensive? Pharmaceutical companies and different companies exit different developed countries every single day. But it doesn't have to, it doesn't affect people. They, they sell it off, people, other people buy it, and they continue because there's competition, there's enough to go around. And that's why we are waiting for another country, uh, another pharmaceutical company from another country to sell drugs to us. Why they have in surplus and they felt like, oh, they are too okay for them to come to Africa and see us as a market. Well, well what do you think about um, the mass migration of health professionals uh, from Nigeria to other parts of the, of the world? It's, it's not news that in most places in Europe, in the US, you would find a large number of their healthcare professionals being from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So we have well-trained experts who keep exiting the country due to one reason or the other. How, how do we address this issue and keep our own people, our own professionals here to take care of our, ourselves? That, that's, the, that, that's what I was saying. Infrastructure. You have assembled a whole number of young people to go to the schools, to go and learn and be in this field of health. And at the end of the day, you don't have the uh, infrastructure to absorb, absorb them. And it's not just in health, but let's go to health. When they are there, some of them are looking for jobs. There's no, there's no job. I mean, you, you, have, you have all the doctors living there. You have where you're supposed to produce drugs. You have chemists. A lot of people that have studied chemistry in these countries have nothing to show about. You have those that study biochemistry, no infrastructure, no system to pull them into job creation. When, when you say no infrastructure or no system, what happened to our public uh, health institutions? What what happened from the primary all the way top up to the tertiary uh, healthcare institutions? Because the structure is always about um, uh, um, not preventive healthcare. Okay. It's not primary. It is more like secondary and tertiary. And tertiary. Because when you're looking at primordial areas of prevention, yes. you're talking about, okay, we need to provide drugs when people before people start getting sick. Yes. We need to know the number of people that we need in Nigeria that are professionals that will provide these services for people in Nigeria. Yes. If you do not think of that and you're waiting for, okay, when people are sick, then they will come to the hospital. And that's when you now have a whole lot of people studying. And then there's no infrastructure, and the infrastructure is not just us, it's not hospital. Industries, health industries, pharmaceutical industries. For manufacturing. For, for, for manufacture. Because if we are only looking at doctors, yeah. medical doctors, as. Uh, no, they are not. In fact, they are not even the backbone of everything in medicine. They are, well, it is when people have gotten they're, sick that they, 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 they are just they, at the front burner of what we see exactly. in the healthcare system. So, there are a lot of people, there is a lot of structure for several health allied, uh, health allied structures that are supposed to be there. And we leave them, or there is also competition of, oh, we are the ones that are supposed to do all unnecessary things that we do not need to have. 
and that's because the structure is not there and then when some groups are at the forefront they feel like oh that is and that's what everybody just understand and that's the mental model that healthcare is doctors and that's not it well how, how do we address the issue of um you know some parents who might not really know the need the need or the importance of immunization for their children against polio uh, especially in rural communities where um, there isn't so much development, there isn't so much information or knowledge with regard to what ha happens in urban cities. We've seen people kick hard against some of these um, uh, remedies by uh, healthcare professionals in rural areas. How do we sensitize these people properly to know the importance of what is being offered to them? Um, there are efforts. The efforts, and I'll give it to the government because uh, if you remember, maybe in 1997, when we first had one of the biggest challenge, where a company, uh, an American company, came into Nigeria to give vaccine to some people, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't give the right vaccine. They used our young people in Nigeria as it as, as lab rats. As lab rats. For and, test. Yeah, and unfortunately, that was one of the biggest challenges that made people. And make people think twice in the rural and grassroots community and feel like no we can't do this and all of that but um efforts are there uh national Health care development those guys are working fantastically well uh, and i know they go I, I have been on the field i've seen how far they go you see people carrying buckets or coolers with ice packs just to get vaccine to river right area yes cross through waters and all which is not the right thing it's not supposed to be like that but I will commend their effort, but at the same time, you don't know where vaccines are coming from. There's no proper education on what the vaccine is. You don't even have infrastructure like people, manpower to educate people. You have very few people going to do all of all this work. And at the end of the day, some people will sit in the office, oh, take this, this thing. People can go and talk about that they, they have delivered or they have given Meanwhile, this vaccine. Meanwhile, they haven't. They haven't. So there's a lot of gap between the, the people at the top yeah. and the people at the grassroots. Exactly. And, and the middlemen are not adequately um, uh, empowered to be able to deliver such exactly. uh, health care Now, services. you also highlighted an importance with credit to the current administration and the Minister of Health, Professor Ali Pate, in terms of the need to go back to the grassroots. Now, it's coming at a time when the government of the day has also seen the need to take governors to court over local government autonomy. Mm -hmm. Now, the hope said that when these monies are disbursed, either through FAC or other allocations, that whoever become the elected chairman of these councils would have a perspective to prioritize health. Mm -hmm. How do we get leaders to prioritize health in a time when our budget priority in several years has been on defense? Okay, um, community engagement stakeholders engagement, talking to people in the grassroots, community leaders, uh, uh, um, chiefs, uh, obers, uh, counselor, uh, counselors, ward chairmen, um, talking to market women, talking to youth groups, talking to different groups. That's the best way because these people that have some slight of knowledge about what is happening can reiterate and say there's funds now. Our, our chairman, local government chairman, it is important that 15% of your allocation yep. goes to healthcare. And trust me, if this is done, I, I have seen an example in some states, in, in rivers, in Lagos, where the chairman just prioritized with, I mean, with little. Because in some local governments, you probably have less than maybe three primary healthcare centers or four, and some even have two. Yep. So it's not something so much for you not to be able to achieve. And by the time we achieve that and uh, you, uh, we, we are able to communicate with the community properly, engage communities. You don't just go and tell them you are giving them this thing. Why are you giving us? Why are you giving it to us? What's the benefit of this? You don't just say, eh, hey, yeah, yeah, are you sick now? Where are you ready? No, you communicate. That's how you do preventive health care. And it, beyond people coming to the hospital, what's the environmental infrastructure of that community? Why are people getting sick unnecessarily? What are the values that you put for health that make people? Are, are, are people eating? You mentioned it that people are poor. Yes. It's true. Coming at a time when people are saying diseases like cholera ought to be a thing of the past, basic provisions for sanitation and hygiene are lacking in a lot of local government councils. So I agree with you on that mm. point. Now, beyond which would be the need for us to also do a needs assessment. Absolutely. But we now look at our leaders again in legislative arms who have some community and constituency projects 
that are not necessarily related towards health. A lot of them prioritize empowerment projects more. Do you yeah. think that this community engagement will be able to change the narrative and perspective of our representatives even in upper legislative chambers? Yeah, so um, my, my, my question and uh, my challenge to everyone is you need to, we need to leave the area of always talking about the federal level now. And like you said, the, they, when they come back home, the people of that community have a responsibility to request for these things. You can keep quiet and say, oh, our, our members of rep, our senators have done this and governors will say they are doing No, you have to ask these questions the way young people ask me questions now. The, but the only challenge is you have to know where you are directing those questions to. So immediately people in the community direct the questions to the right people. And the unfortunate thing is that when you don't ask the right people the right question, you give them the opportunity to evade their responsibility. You are not asking the answer of why are you doing this? Is this empowerment that we need only or empowerment of just providing some little items and all of that? But we are talking of structure. You give somebody grinding machine to do something, but after the end of the day, the water that they are drinking is not safe. Then that person grinds pepper for maybe 1,000 people and then uses water that was gotten from unclean or unsanitized or not well treated bottle, then pour it into the washing machine and everybody disperses dirty water and then cholera and breaks there, out. There's, there's a widespread of yeah, cholera. Yeah, and then there's typhoid. And people and that's why a lot of people always say they have typhoid, which typhoid is not something that should, everybody should be saying they have. Because typhoid, I don't know where people hear that they're having typhoid. But <laughs> then, because it's, it's not something... It's as like casual as, as saying I have a headache now. Yeah, <laughs> so, and it's not supposed to... Typhoid is a very, very serious ailment. Mm. Yes. So if everybody's having typhoid in the community, then there's a problem. Well, I, I like how you, you know, touched on the need for uh, the people in power to be held accountable for uh, providing some of these um, infrastructural services. Um, I, I recall doing a documentary somewhere in uh, Mayondaga community. This is in uh, Gembu, that's yeah. South Dana local government mm -hmm. area in Taraba State. And uh, one of the major things that caught my attention there was the fact that cars couldn't you know go into that community so people had to use bikes and sometimes just walk on foot to get to a river where they'd have to cross with canoes before they get to so women pregnant women often died at the bank of that particular yeah, river yeah. separating the community and uh, the urban the urban yeah. part of the local government area now in a situation like this are we to blame the healthcare uh, f facility there now, or the healthcare officials there, or are we to blame the government who are not providing adequate adequate infrastructure to ease means of transportation from point A to point B in this community? No, it has nothing to do with healthcare uh, workers. It's not their fault. Well, well, isn't that another problem bedeviling the sector, don't you think? Yes, it is. And even for them, it's a problem from them. Because by the time you are recording debts in your facility and yes. you have to send it out to state or government, then it means you are not working. So nobody wants to send out a report and say that we cannot even assess people. So it is a problem. Of the, and that's why we say the structure is important. You have a community. There is need for proper land. There is need for proper water. There is need for proper um, roads. Accessibility to need for proper. So it is not a structure of just health. And that's why I kept going back to infrastructure. Because these things happen in circles, they're, they're, they're intertwined. If there's like no proper chain reaction. Yeah, if there's no road, then you cannot assess health. If there's no water, then you become sick. If there's no light, then the mosquitoes are killing you. Yes. If there's no proper sanitation, then the environment is not safe. And then, or whether this, there's insecurity, and then at some point, someone wants to steal something that injures you know, the property because there is poverty. So all of all those things are interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a spectrum of events from one structure that will not lead to the health challenge. The health challenge. So the health challenge is one thing, but achieving it, it does not have to do with just providing infrastructure for health alone, but societal, and, and we call something social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are those things that will determine if health you need, uh, we need primary health, uh, primary care or secondary care, or if you just provide a structure where those challenges do not even happen. You know, you have more women in the community and you do not see the reason for providing a safe delivery unit or antenatal session. Then at, at some point, you've not, you've not identified the demography of those people. Yes. You're looking at young people in that community. The community have older people. How do you expect an old person to cross that river? 
And at the end of the day, the few people that can actually do these things, like you said, or you have some, I've, I've seen cases like, I've been there, I've yes. worked in those, those cities, I see how people suffer to cross river. And some of them, some pass the river, and the river takes some people away. And the away. river takes them away, yes. As you mentioned. So there are even some that provide lines where people are climbing in line and to cross, and then the line just breaks through, and then they are in, in the water. So some children are going to school, they have to cross through dirty water, and then the next thing you have people having rain gum. So, and that's how you now get to the challenge of having health challenges because there is no road, and then you have to cross so, uh, water. A lot of de defects and deficiency in infrastructure now leads to the health exactly. challenges that yes. we see. And, and like I said, it's the local government. I'm going to pin it down on them. That is what But it's, it's a good thing that they now have autonomy. So, yeah. a lot of money coming in should be utilized properly for uh, the safe health care delivery for their people yeah. well well b before before we we um, move forward on this let's address the issue of quackery in the healthcare sector mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people who might not you know have the means to go to uh, standard hospitals or healthcare centers to get quality um, services tend to uh, resort to over-the-counter drugs administered by unqualified individuals and this is prominent in rural communities. Again, I still have on rural communities. How do we mitigate some of these challenges? And how do we uh, solve the problem of quackery in the system? Uh, uh, it's, it's a challenge because in a way you have a mental model of structure of things where things have become a norm. Yes. Then it will be difficult to actually pinpoint one direction of um, solution. Before now, uh, we used to call this one, I mean, some people used to call it chemist. You go to chemist and all of that. Procuring of drugs has to even come with a license. You go to the manufacturer, you're supposed to have a license to even buy these drugs before you then go to sell, sell in your communities. Yes. Uh, although they have tried, there are, there are some structures that are in place where those that have these things, there are some they have infrastructure that are and facilities to train these people and say, okay, you're selling. But in the first instance, that should be the first thing. You train anybody that wants to open those places. And then when you train, because we, we call them, uh, 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 there's a project that that's called, when I remember I'll mention okay. it. If you do not have a structure of saying, we, like I say, we need hospitals in our, uh, we need pharmacies in our society. Yes. You must have thought of that beforehand, that uh -huh. people will get it. When you have that, when you are thinking, and then the next thought, line of thought will be, okay, you are supposed to train people that will be in those places. But if you have not thought of that, and those are coming as a secondary child, when people say, oh, we can't get drugs. Then and somebody there's a say, gap. And there's a gap. Oh, I can be selling drugs to people. Who, I know somebody in Kuala. The person can arrange so, yeah. this thing for me and bring, and that's where this, the challenge starts from. So it will be difficult for even the structure that is available to challenge those people and say, oh, why are you selling? And that's why they now Because provide. provisions have not been made. made. So then they now, they went ahead, which they are doing, but it's still not the right way. But they have gone ahead to now go identify all of all these PPMV. So they go ahead. medical vendors. Yes, yes. Because we see some organizations like Breakthrough Action Nigeria mm -hmm. reach out to them to be able to refer persons in the case of persons who have been coughing for more than six weeks, yeah. in terms of their tobacco loss invention, exactly, yeah. uh, th these are some concerns as well because a lot of these communities at, at the local level rely more on traditional medicine and these yeah. potent medical vendors. Mm -hmm. how, how do we synergize uh, these calls to have better referrals and also certified persons retailing drugs? So uh, it is to have a structure of training these people. You can't send them away now because they don't even have the structure to put the proper one there. So you train them. Then the traditional uh, vendors, uh, about vendors, you train them also. And I think that's why uh, the Ministry of Health has a department of, of that so that they can trickle down that effect and all the commissions of it also, and Ministry of Health also have those things. But those trainings, how effective are they? Yes. How are they responding to it? Those are the things you now have to do a proper assessment of. And they look at the gaps in those places and say, in this community, we must identify the number of people that are selling about drugs. Have a record of it. All of you, if you know you want to continue selling, you must go for at least maybe two, three months training. And then you must also learn the proper way of restructuring or referring when you have identified these this, this, this challenges within your community. People are coughing, people are having bile and all of this. Why is it happening? They refer back to a structure that will be available to attend to these people. You know, because if some of them even identify this and then they want to make complaint, 
and they are worried about if I come to, if I mention that this person has been coming to me for long for this and this and this, I will not be in trouble. And then they are scared to go out. And then it, it's not their challenge or it's not their fault also that people cannot afford the drugs. Affordability, when there's no affordability, there's no accessibility, people resort to what they think can help them. Yeah. That, that, that's the problem. Okay, uh, well, let's, let's also um, mirror into uh, still talking about quackery. Now, quackery uh, isn't just about people sem selling drugs in, in quotes, mm -hmm. chemists that mm -hmm. we know, the, yeah. the many pharmacies that we see, uh, you know, in rural communities. We also have quack doctors in yeah. hospitals, especially in privately owned hospitals. You would agree with me. In as much as some private hospitals are, are quite good, well equipped, and have uh, fantastic professionals who work there, there are other private in hospitals that have a lineup of quack doctors and quack nurses, and you know, it's quite detrimental to what a hospital should be. Don't you think so? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at some of the deaths that people even the deaths happening in some hospitals, probably most the majority of them, some of them are because of quack. Yes. Quack medical professionals in those places, where I've I've seen a case where some years ago in a clinic or in a hospital, general hospital in the states, which I don't want to mention, and I I, I was there to just see someone that was in clinic, and then a child was, uh, was about, you know, to die, and I see how they were rushing to call the nurses and the doctors, and it was difficult for them to respond. I had to rush down to step in to step in to meet not even do any but to i mean identify the office of the the doctor there and say something is happening you need to be there and apparently they have gone like twice to rush and i'm like what are you doing here and then the, the child he, they went there. but unfortunately that day uh, i left because i just called him in. and by the time i came i was told that the child has so another issue is is lack of timely response, timely from, response. from these hospitals. And that's because the professionalism is poor, even for those that are qualified. Now let's go to quackery. Uh, there, there is a form of licensing for doctors, right? Yes. And for all uh, hospitals that are supposed to be in Nigeria, has to get a license to operate. Yes. Now, and when you are operating, you are supposed to have a at least a minimum number of professionals in your hospital, right? Uh, which will now make the management give you a license to operate. I don't think they follow that. Because you can't say you have one doctor and you have one nurse and then you have different people just there, auxiliary and all auxiliary of those, and then you are and you say you have staff to manage your hospital. A primary, let's even leave that, let's say a primary, primary health care center. center. That's not, that's not, it. that's well, dispensary. Well, that's the case we see in most primary health care And that is why they employ several people that are quacks that have gone to, learn. in fact, the PPC nurse, a nurse, supposed nurse, learning from another nurse, and then following the nurse around to go and learn the, this, and then at some point they even do graduation for themselves. And in say, the hospitals? Uh, yes. Now, whilst this is some pressing concerns, let's also factor in some of the good work that private individuals are doing and some well-meaning Nigerians have done in medical outreaches. We also look at even the military, the Navy. Most of them have it in their calendar for routine medical interventions in communities they find themselves as their corporate social responsibility, CSR. How do we engender much of such in Nigeria to help mitigate some of these gaps and quackery that affects the health sector? So, uh, as you mentioned, as I said earlier, there are a lot of efforts the government is putting They are working tirelessly. I know that because I know what the system looks like. And as you mentioned, the military, you know, I mean, because of discipline. I think discipline is the, 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 the key thing there. The c discipline of the government, discipline of citizens. Because if people are disciplined, just like how the military hospital, you go to military hospital and you see the difference. It's, it's different because there's discipline. You, are, you have a time for an appointment. You are there. Doctors do not take it for granted. The nurses do not take it. Everybody attends to you professionally. So if they are doing that in that sector, that means that discipline is lacking in other private so, uh, sectors. Sector. Yes, and other government. Because when there is no discipline, then you would have that structure not being effective. You have people just there and then uh, their work is more like they're just thinking about, oh, I'm just going to get my salary at the end of the month. There is no, there's no reward for hard work. 
I can't attend to 15 patients at the same time and then I'm not going to get sleep. I mean, that person is human. Also. That's another important point because the demographics of patient to doctor ratio is well overstretching. Yes, it is. So when, when you look at that, and then which is also discipline because, and I'm, like I mentioned, you yeah, are giving license to places where they have only two, three, or one doctor, and you, it, the, out, the outcome is going to be terrible. It's going to be bad. And at the end of the day, we report it in our NDHS, National Demographic Health Survey, and say, last two years we are progressing and then this year we are coming back again so these are the things that we need to i think discipline will be the answer that i will mention and citizens also knowing that it is their right to get proper health care in this place you don't just keep quiet and say nurse is treating me so no you don't keep quiet by the time uh, 5 10 15 people make this complaint in one clinic or in one hospital then even those that are there even if there's no disciplinary action they will start realizing that okay maybe our board members or the board of the medical uh, yeah. council will not do it but the people that come here every day are noticing that oh we will not take this attitude from yeah. you so we have that responsibility as citizens to play because some of the times i don't think it is the government that is the majority of the issue like you mentioned when we go back to the funding issue government has tried because the budget for the whole country is is still small so they increased it from three or four percent to about seven percent seven percent but even at that it still won't result and that's because they feel like oh there are other pressing issues and then there's support coming from people as you say private private uh, uh sector people dangote foundation is there i mean they pledged about two billion some some last year or last two years yeah. during the uh patient i go Mokude is there sfh is there all of all these guys are doing their bits so they are investing well the investment that i would recommend that they do is investment in the infrastructure that would build the healthcare system well you you mentioned uh, lack of discipline in most hospitals as you know the root cause of uh, why people aren't getting access to quality healthcare uh, service delivery I, w I believe I speak for a majority of Nigerians when I say Nigerians share a certain sentiment with regard to when people are rushed to hospitals for emergencies and you know the hospital staff ask them to go get a police report or come, al come along with a police officer and sometimes these are done in areas where they can't easily access a police station to call a, pol a, p a police officer or there is actually no time for getting a police officer to come along because it's an emergency obviously and in most cases people die i personally know of people who have been victims of such occurrences how do we close up this gap between okay. the healthcare uh, sector that's hospitals these the police and of course people coming in for emergencies okay so starting from the first one the healthcare workers yes uh and that's the reason why many of them are moving abroad because the system frustrates them to work yes. without pay. So sometimes they feel like this is not rewarding enough to do some things. And then before now, uh, where if a doctor should attend to a patient that is maybe emergency or, or an accident and you need a police report, who wants to put their hands into something that will come back to haunt them? And then you try to help the the, the, the patients, patient. and later you are getting a court order or an arrest, and then you are invited. So that and you are not paid enough. So you feel like, mm, I mean, let's work and stop with you. Now you won't do them. No, that happens. But then let's go back to the reality. The reality is that there is no law. The law has abolished that. That if you go to an hospital. All medical professionals there, the hospital, the clinic, must attend to you, irrespective of a police. But are we seeing that happening in our hospitals? And that, and I, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's happening. I know that some people are doing it, but then we've not gotten universally, we've not gotten it. But then I always come back to how this thing works. The people themselves need to voice out. The police, even the police are looking at the manpower of the police is not even enough for the country in the first instance. But we have about I think one police to four thousand people or so. So it will never be enough. But I can guarantee you that when citizens have the right knowledge and say when you get to the hospital, I mean, you've seen some cases where these things happen and people go online and then make this a case and say yes. we brought somebody and then actions are yeah. taken. Yeah. 
maybe everybody will not get to be able to go online to and, make this and, and shout but, out there yeah, but that. then when you see, when that is happening it's 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 it tells how this thing can change the mental model of both the hospital staff the patient the family of the patient or whoever brought the patient the police itself and that way you see the when, when this happened you see the IG of police coming out or the commissioners of the coming out to say we have said this this will not happen this must stop identify the police officer and the police officer that are doing that when they are arrested the next one will not try to go and commit that kind of crime again and say what well, you know, the law has stated and your IG have demanded that nobody should arrest so and that's it when we start making those requests because it doesn't happen that government will just make a law and government will still uphold it no it is the people that have to support that thing to happen if they're not supporting it then it won't work well, I must thank you, Mr. Rashid Yusuf, for your vehement opinions and constructive contributions to the discussion today. We appreciate you. Thank you.